And I have three guest panelists, Miss Kimberly, um, Miss Aslam, and Mr. Leonard. As you can see on the screen, y'all can say hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Okay. okay, so I am the host, um, Miss Emily Anna Beecham. Um, I'm going to give you all a, a little bit about me if you don't know me. So I am a final year student doing my special in psychology. Um, I'm also the president of the Student Psychology Association, and I represent numerous associations, including PsychI, the Honor, so Honor Society of Psychology, um, also the Peer Counseling Association, and Youth Visionaries of Trinidad and Tobago, right? Um, I have a burning passion to um, help persons that are suffering from mental illnesses. And, you know, it's, it's a really tragic thing that everybody's going through all around the world. And, you know, we need more psychologists to come out and, you know, find, find some sorts of solutions. I mean, it doesn't fix the problem thoroughly, but, you know, we, we have to be the ones to uh, make the change, right? Um, fun fact, well, my favorite color is pink and purple. But as you know, I, I like dressing up like a unicorn, as you can see. <laughs> I love the rainbow. Um, when I'm not studying psychology, I I love to sing. I love to play instruments like the steel pan, which is originated in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I even like to dance. Um, I, I like doing makeup and nails and a whole lot more about me. But today is not about me. Today is about my three panelists that I... Um, are going to, to have a very engaging discussion this afternoon with you about the different types of psychology that you know you can venture into for your career paths, right? So um, I'm just going to give you like a little brief about the types of psychology that there are. So there's abnormal, there is behavioral, there's clinical, cognitive, comparative, and counseling. And, and there's a whole lot more, but these are just the, the few main ones that I would say us Trinidadians know about. Um, mostly, um, we we tend to go to only counseling and, um, you know, the, the clinical type of psychology. And, you know, it, it, we need to be more aware that there are different types of psychology that we can actually get involved in and, you know, have a career with as well. Right. I mean, sometimes I know and it causes me the problems, right? But um, today, this discussion is just to enlighten you about the different types of psychology that you can venture in for your career paths um, for the future, right? Because we all want to do something that we are um, very passionate about. And, you know, it, it would help <laughs> when you, you really do what you like, right? So, um, as you know, abnormal, this one is involved in psychopathology and abnormal behavior, right? Um, so I'm just giving you a little brief about each. I mean, there's a whole depth about these different types of psychology. When you look at it, the modules are very, very, um, very um, big. You know, there's plenty of different aspects to it. Um, there's behavioral. So this is like learned behaviors. Um, you know, when when we're looking at Mandur's theory, that is that is um, learned behaviors like modeling and issue that you want to go into if you um, want to continue. You know, looking at those those aspects that I'm speaking about. And there's clinical, like most people know about, which is concerned with um, the assessment of your treatment and, and medical, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, of the abnormal behavior. So like in the DSM-5, which is a diagnostic uh, statistical manual of the um, American psycho psychological um, uh, diagnosis, that really is what, you know, people use, who, who are doing clinical psychology would use that manual to help them to treat persons with mental illnesses and whatnot, or any abnormal behavior that they probably are showing, right? Um, then there's cognitive, and the cognitive is basically um, your, your internal status of, of your mental 
um, mind, your mind and your, your mental state, basically. So you're looking at more the brain and the, how, how it affects your behavior, basically. But you're looking more so at your, um, how you think, right, um, cognitively. And then the comparative, which I find is a very, very interesting um, type of psychology. This one is, it, it deals with looking at animals to understand how people behave, right? Because, you know, um, for instance, with classical conditioning, Pavlov and the dog experiment, you know, we can see that um, when you put a stimulus, right, um, like a neutral stimulus, and then you pair it with something that they know of, right, which is um, unconditional stimulus, they can become conditioned eventually, like with the ring of a bell and you paint it with food. You know, so those are some of the things. I don't want to get too much into it, but this is just briefly for you to understand that, um, you know, animal behavior, we can see that, okay, they can learn. They can learn it. This is a type of learning. And then compare it with how humans react and behave when, you know, they get um, acquainted in a new situation or they are introduced to something new, right? Um, and last but not least, there's counseling um, type of psychology. So this one is basically where, you know, um, there are persons with mental illnesses and they need to, you know, they need someone to vent, they need someone to talk to, to for them to feel um, validated in, in the point of being just human, you know, that they, they are valuable, they are precious, and the, these things. So counseling, you know, they have different types of counselors too. So that's just like a brief um, of the, the, the few that I know of. Um, and that's why I, I have my three panelists guests today to share with you all about their experiences in their fields. And if you all have any questions and comments, we'll take it at the end of the session. So now I will hand you over to Miss Kimberly. She is from Tanzania and she will give you a little bit about her perspective and experience. Okay. Hello, everyone. So my name is Kimberly, and I'm from Tanzania, uh, eastern part of Africa, for those who don't know exactly where Tanzania is. But currently, I'm based in Cyprus at the moment. I'm in my second year of psychology, uh, pursuing my bachelor's degree. So in Tanzania, when it comes to psychology, it is not prevalent, nor at a field most will actually pursue. Most align it with treating mad people or the insane and which is clearly isn't. And I must admit that I also was one among the few people who was like them before I started pursuing psychology because you will never hear anything about them. So you need to actually be in that department or around that field to actually know what exactly psychologists do. Um, so sad to say in my country, even with this realm right now in the 21st century, mental health, cognitive dissonance, stereotypes are still a stigma in my country. Most of the psychologists we have, and, it, uh, and it's hard in acclimating or functioning, but recently we have changes and there's been a shift where most people are becoming forthcoming and they're accepting psychologists and know exactly what psychologists do. When it comes to fields that are common in my country, to be per se, we have clinical psychology, intercultural relations, which I know it's a new field and most people don't know about it. So this started uh, back in 2018, I believe, and it involves studying different cultures and it's it embraces humanity and also brings out all the major differences we have currently and so far. We also have counselors and also other type of fields. For my view, until now, psychology is a wild field and its trajectories are very wide. One can be a psycho-oncologist, which I recently found out in EFSA webinar, and only few countries employ this. There's also Agile and Scrum, which you can be a project manager, which also I learned about this in EFSA webinar. From my school and experience, I I actually work in an NGO called Caritas, and our beneficiaries are asylum seekers and refugees. So I actually do something which is related to this type of people. So what I basically do is I do counseling, a bit of counseling and a bit of psychoanalysis, and I will dive deep into it once I graduate. And um, what I've noticed is with psychology, 
you can basically you can basically be anywhere. You can do anything because when it comes to EFSA, EFSA and when I joined EFSA, uh, I'm actually currently a content reviewer in EFSA, and I'm doing something that I never thought I could actually do. And we have psychology students and graduates who are working in different fields and different sectors of the organization. So that gives you a wide spectrum of exactly what we can do and what we can become. So there's not really a specific trajectory where you can actually go or where you can actually attain, but I feel like you have this wide spectrum and you can choose exactly what you want to do. I'll talk about mediation. So mediation, most people, it's not really common in many countries, but it's common in Cyprus. And we actually receive some training of it in school and people mostly align it to law but it's actually law based and also psychology based. And mediation is really relevant right now because with the ongoing uh, conflicts that we have, whether in big companies, organization, even at home or sometimes randomly in the street, you need to know how you can mitigate with someone. You need to know how you can talk with someone, how you can sort of like solve the conflict, you know, how you present yourself and the words that you're going to utter, the words that you're going to say, how you're going to perceive yourself, how you're going to present yourself, really matters and you need to not be biased. So psychology gives you all this platform and it also gives you approaches. Because um, before I did psychology, I was doing medicine and I had no idea there was something called holistic approach, multifaceted approach. I had no idea. But with psychology, now I know exactly what approach I can use in with different people and different situations. Because not every approach works for everyone. Even for me, there's some approaches I really they don't really work for me. And I have to align myself according to what I see best and what fits. Um, well, how I, and to answer another question is how I get into what I'm doing right now and an advice that I'll give to every psychology student out there, because I come from a place where psychology, mental health and everything catering around it is still a stigma. So when I moved to Cyprus, which is in the EU, I told myself I have to challenge myself. I have to leave and I have to disregard all the social stigma and the social norms that I came with from my country. So what I did is I had to look for organizations that stand with psychology. I had to, I had to survey. I had to look at places where I could gain so much knowledge. And EFSA was one of them, you get it. And also where I volunteer. So I'm trying my best. I'm telling people that you need to be forthcoming when it comes to Googling, surveying, what things you can do. Because most of the things that I know right now, I had no clue, no idea. And even the people back home don't really know exactly what's happening. You get it? But it's you taking the motivation and the initiative to go around. And I am grateful for EFSA because I have gained so much connection. I have gained so much. Uh, I have gained so much about psychology that I didn't even know. Like when I talked about agile and Scrum, I had no idea what exactly that meant, and I had no idea it even existed. And especially like psycho oncology, I had no idea that things like this that existed. So it gave me, it represented, and it gave me a picture of what exactly psychology is and what exactly I can do. And this is something that people need to know that you can do anything and you can become anything. It doesn't have to be the same thing that everyone is doing, which is clinical psychology or counseling. You can actually divert and go somewhere else. Like, for example, me who's working with uh, asylum seekers and refugees. And that is something which you can do. So anybody can be anything. And right now we all know about the COVID-19 situation where everything is gone online. There's also applications where you can have e-mental health, which I also knew from um, EFSA. So there's so many things you can actually discover if you just join yourself in organizations or communities and look around and search. And that's it. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Oh my God, that, that really is so nice to hear from you. <laughs> Wow, it's it's really intriguing to know that, you know, you're in a whole different country and for you to have that same sentiment that I'm speaking about that, you know, yeah, it's not just about that one little piece of psychology that, um, you know, most people want to go into. There's so much more that you can do um, with psychology, right? So up next, I want to um, warmly welcome 
Miss Oslam. She has received her PhD in clinical psychology that we've been talking about, but um, she's currently working in Ser Serena, a company developing artificial intelligence, a digital therapy service for treating psychological disorders. So I want to warmly welcome you. <laughs> the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much um, for organizing this, first of all. And it was very inspiring to listen to Emily and Kimberly and your experience. Um, well, I think what I'm going to talk about is very clear. Uh, so I will be talking about e-mental health within a clinical psychology field. But a bit about myself, um, like Emily said, I'm based in the Netherlands and uh, have finished my PhD degree in in clinical psychology. So I'm much more aware of the developments in clinical psychology um, in Europe. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes. Yes, we're hearing you, Han. Okay, yes. So uh, back in 2012, um, so I was exchanging emails with uh, professors for PhD positions, and I want to do my PhD in clinical psychology. And um, so I was looking into Netherlands um, because I knew that um, actually through EFSA, because I was involved in EFSA like Kimberly back then, um, I knew that um, Netherlands is a good uh, record in research and I want to do the, I want to do the research. So um, I exchanged emails with this professor um, so in suicidology field. And um, so he mentioned about this e-health intervention that he developed with his PhD students for managing suicidal thoughts. And uh, he asked if I would be interested in translating this intervention for Turkish speaking uh, migrant populations and test whether it works or not. And back then, um, it was for the first time that I heard of e-health, e-mental health, online therapy, digital interventions. And I was fascinated with this idea. And I moved to, to Netherlands. Back then, I was living in the UK. I packed my stuff, moved to Netherlands, and I started this PhD. Um, and so my PhD was about adapting this existing e-health intervention for managing suicidal thoughts according to uh, Turkish speaking migrants living in the UK and in the Netherlands. And I tested whether this was a feasible intervention and whether and it was effective in treating suicidal uh, thoughts. So I want to talk a little bit about e-health interventions since Kimberly mentioned, um, so what they are and um, so how they work within clinical psychology fields a little bit to give you an idea. So e-health interventions, digital therapists, therapies, they are delivered to computers, mobile phones or tablets and have been introduced to mental health services relatively recently. So in addition to or alternative or face-to-face service delivery. And um, e-health interventions, they can be delivered either uh, guided or unguided. So guidance is when the intervention is delivered by a coach or a clinician, and it is aimed at motivating people uh, to stay in the intervention, to explain things which are not clear, and to provide feedback on the content of the sessions. And unguided is when uh, the intervention doesn't involve a therapist or a coach giving you guidance, but it can involve automated feedback, but it doesn't have any professional support. So you are actually doing things by yourself and it is uh, uh, called self-help. And uh, recently there's also, um, since this field is developing very fast, uh, there's an um, so they are supported by artificially intelligent uh, system. Uh, so there is this field developing. So the artificially intelligent digital therapists, they actually um, learn about you and they start predicting your behavior and they try to personalize the treatment according to, to your profile, your preferences as much as possible. So, um, like I said, it is a growing field in not only in clinical psychology, but also in other areas of psychology, um, like educational psychology, social psychology, health psychology, like Kimberly mentioned, um, because they are available, accessible and cost-effective. But in clinical psychology, there are several 
presumed advantages of these interventions compared to face-to-face -face interventions. Uh, they are, like I said, they are accessible to internet. They can remove logistical barriers such as transportation to the services, or they are also assumed to remove some personal related uh, barriers such as, uh, like Kimberly mentioned, stigma attached to seeking help uh, for mental health problems. Um, and they promise personalized services depending on the service user's preferences. Um, so they can be adapted depending on the language of the service user and cultural preferences. So um, there's a growing evidence for their uh, effectiveness in engaging with people from different backgrounds, people from across uh, different uh, lifespan and from different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, in treatment of uh, common mental health disorders uh, such as depression and anxiety especially but also in treatment of suicidal thoughts so this evidence is uh, mainly coming from western countries from high income countries but um, recently it is there are efforts uh, in translating this evidence into low resource settings as well and also low um, war-torn countries in middle east uh, because of uh, the presumed advantages of these services in terms of their accessibility. And um, like also Emily mentioned in the beginning, so with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it is expected that uh, there will be increasing demands for mental health services and there will be economic recession following the pandemic. So in order to deal with this increasing demand for mental health care, um, it is uh, so the e-mental health uh, interventions, they seem promising to fill this gap and to pr provide services um, to everyone who, who, who is needed. Uh, and it seems like they will be becoming uh, important and part of our lives also in the foreseeable future. Yes, this is so far what I wanted to mention um, about this e-mental health within clinical psychology field. Thank you so much, Ms. Aslam. I really, really like that you are, you know, still inspiring and, you know, letting everybody know that, you know, clinical psychology has a lot that has to offer, right? Um, so up next, um, I would like to warmly introduce Mr. Leonard Valls. He is a research master's student in psychology at the University of Amsterdam after doing his bachelor at the University of Vienna. He's primarily um, interested in psychological research methods, particularly applied statistics and directly psycho psychology related. He is passionate about educational psychology and psychometrics. I give you the floor. Yeah, so that's basically the short introduction uh, for me. Um, I think that's kind of the most important things. My my area of psycho psychology is um, mainly the research side and very much um, even a step, a step further in how do we actually do psychological research? How do we find out things about the psyche of uh, people? And uh, for me specifically right now, that means uh, interest in statistics, kind of how can we be sure um, about a certain certain phenomena. How, how can we quantify them? How can we, how can we quantify uncertainty in that sense as well? Um, and that then, of course, uh, is relevant for all sorts of different um, fields in psychology, um, because we would like to do research in all sorts of different, uh, fields of psychology. That and that then of course relates to a couple of other areas where um, how do we do um, evidence-based um, practice in um, in psychology. So how do we then translate um, the knowledge we acquire, acquired in the research process to actual practice? So for example, e-health, what um, Oslam just um, introduced. Um, that's kind of my, uh, what I'm currently mainly um, concerned with. I think like, uh, but to, to touch on what Kimberly said, said before primarily as well, I think the, the classical picture of psychology still is very much uh, the, um, the idea of psychotherapy, um, kind of being concerned with 
um, mental health uh, or mental issues uh, primarily, but at least for me, like psychology encompasses everything that humans interact with, humans do, uh, that is related to uh, to humans in general, which more or less is everything in our society. So uh, that also echoes Kimberly's sentiment where with psychology, you can basically do everything, work in every in every field to some sense. Um, and for me specifically, like uh, during my bachelor's, I um, worked a student assistant in um, educational psychology. And that's pretty interesting to me, kind of this process of uh, how does psychology interact in uh, education? How do we learn? How do we, how, how do social interactions uh, work in the classroom at university in in later life? Concerned to uh, the acquisition of new knowledge, or how do we um, retain knowledge? Kind of all of those uh, all of those questions um, over the whole lifespan of. Uh, education. And that's kind of something I'm very interested in, specifically then also connecting it to my interest in, in psychology. That's why um, I put that into my introduction, psychometrics, how can we then quantify, how can we, um, yeah, how can we quantify uh, educational outcomes, for example, how can we quantify how well a person per performs in a given task, what can, uh, how, um, what should we pay um, attention to specifically, how can we um, best uh, measure this, this learning process and it's kind of like one of the, one of the things I uh, I'm pretty interested in kind of this, this question of how would this, uh, it's kind of this question of what is what is knowledge in that sense how can we, can we quantify that how can we um, change things about that I think that's like educational psychology is something that should be uh, much more prevalent specifically in educational policy as well so how do we actually structure schools how do we structure an ed educational system more broadly to to do that um and yeah, another field i would quickly like to touch on as well because that's uh in in a sense related but also one uh an interest of mine is kind of this, this area of economic psychology or then shifting into work psychology because that's probably one of the most um or one of the fields where it's most easy to find a job in as well. And you should, if you're not familiar with that yet, sh should be familiar with it's kind of, again, the psychological processes in business context, in economic context, or in work context specifically, um, where then e-health might, might be relevant as well, for example, but the, is of course much more broadly. And uh, since all companies are interested in how to best structure their, uh, human processes um that is a field that is like a very valuable to go into and then be able to have a career later on as well and i think that's it from me for now and looking forward to the uh actual panel session after me i think yep thank you so much mr leonard for sharing okay so Moving along, I have two questions for any of our panel guests to, to you know, respond to. So what are some other areas of psychology that are unknown or you think is still developing where you guys are from? Anybody can answer. Um, okay, so as I talked to and mentioned before, I talked about intercultural relation. It's a new, new right. field in psychology. And um, only a few countries actually employ it. And I'm not so sure what countries uh, do at the meantime, but I only know in Tanzania we do have it. And it's very fascinating because you would never really think it would actually be something of psychology. So it's basically, just to keep it up straight, it's, um, how, you know, how we have different cultures and how we are different yeah. from each other. And working with people from different culture can sort of be, can lead to conflict, can lead to a lot of bias things. It can lead to a lot of a right. whole connection. So when you enter this field, you know how to deal with people according to their culture and how to embrace them. So it's a really nice, nice field to yeah. enter. And I'm even looking into getting into it with time, hopefully. But, um, <laughs> I really love this. It's it's sort of like embracing cultures because we stay yeah. in this world where we just vision ourselves and we we know we're different with race, but we mm -hmm. don't really accept our cultures. We never really acknowledge it. So it's good yeah. to acknowledge that my culture is different from all the panelists, including you, Emily, 
and how can we actually coexist in this image where we work together and yes exactly thank you anybody else wants to add mm, i think like with with me being from germany i feel like at least we we do have uh, a representation of most fields of psychology in in, in some sense. Um, okay. I think the the main thing there is just that in in the broader public, this picture of psychology is an incredibly mm -hmm. uh, broad field with all sorts of different um, areas. Right. Um, in it is not really there yet, but I think that's that's something to to work on that um, for okay. for psychologists specifically, kind of how to get this picture of psychology as something that concerns all area of lives into the broader public, so that psychology isn't seen as equivalent with psychotherapy yeah. anymore. I think that's kind of a big issue, at least in uh, in Central Europe. In in my opinion, that might extend to uh, most yeah. other um, countries as well. And, and the the other thing is about the, <laughs> but again referring to what Oslam is doing, I think that like uh, for for psychology something that's that's developing is how do we get the internet um, digital like the digital yeah. world connected to to what we're doing specifically in practice and like mm -hmm. how does how do we interact with digital and environments um, right. AI methods, for for example I think that's something that is like very definitely developing Important, right now. yeah. I agree. I actually agree. <laughs> okay, Aslan, do you do you have anything that you'd like to say? Um, well, yeah, I was processing actually what Kimberly and Leonard just said. Um, and um, <laughs> I'm basically, um, I'm interested in uh, how we can use psychology. Well, I myself from a culturally diverse background and I'm living in the Netherlands. Right. I, Yes, I'm a migrant here. Um, well, it's, it's been a while actually, but still I call myself migrant. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I'm, in, I'm interested in how we use psychology um, to be able to uh, communicate and to access uh, the vulnerable groups, how we can um, address cultural differences, how we can make interventions relevant to uh, everyone. And uh, I think right. Kimberly emphasized that a lot. And um, so with e-health interventions, for instance, so I said, oh, they are very promising and lots of advantages accessible mm -hmm. through internet. And uh, uh, they remove barriers like stigma is not there because you don't have to see a therapist. Um, okay. But um, still, um, this doesn't mean <laughs> that they don't have limitations. Uh, because uh -huh. for instance, when I was doing my PhD, I actually, this um the population that i was interested in there is also a strong stigma attached to seeking help for mental health services and even yeah. talking about mental health publicly is a is a taboo um yes and um i thought this e-health intervention okay this could it could remove those barriers but um it was still difficult to engage with people still i mean they didn't mm -hmm. need to see a therapist but still the stigma was there right. because people People didn't consider oh e health, but I mean, could it help me? Um, of course, we are moving towards uh, digitalization, and everything is becoming yeah. digital. So maybe we are getting used to more hearing about digital interventions, e health. But still, um, cultural differences are there. Some uh, ethnic groups might not um, accept it immediately. Um, mm -hmm. So we should do more groundwork. We should understand what people expect, how we can make this relevant to people's mm -hmm. expectations, preferences. Um, so I'm passionate about this uh, personally. Uh, I think it's because of my background that I'm uh, aware of cultural differences. And so what people can expect from help in terms of help, what do they mean by help? So mm -hmm. um, not only text itself, uh, but also visuals, like Emily, you are, I know your artistic side is very strong, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. so recently I started uh, developing an interest in visual psychology more. So right. how, how we use images, pictures um, to communicate with people, how do we use them therapeutically? Um, like the Instagram stories people share, we know that yeah. 
from stories we can understand uh, a lot about whether someone is depressed, isolated, or um, yeah, that, that's feeling quite happy. True. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm recently, uh, yeah, recently developed an interest in um, interventions that we could do through Instagram and through social media, but mm -hmm. also um, using more visual psychology to understand and to reach people. Yeah. Wow, that, <laughs> that's very, very interesting. And um, I, I think that's really cool because I, um, I don't know if this is a thing, but you all could tell me I was actually interested in something called like music therapy, you know, where you can use that to, to help persons, you know, keep calm, you know, persons that have anxiety and all these things. So, I mean, it's really um, a lot of intervention, like you say, that we, we, we are still evolving, you know, as psychology students and generations to come. And I mean, it's good. It's good that we can talk about it and, you know, get it somewhere, get it out there, you know, and start working on it as well. So, um, well, one last question, but it already kind of ties into what we were talking about is um, to explain what type of career paths you think um, would be available to individuals with regards to those kind of psychology fields, like what kind of careers they can get out of it, besides being like academia, you know, like if they want to actually become, uh, you know, a type of psychologist or something. Anyone can go. <laughs> um, I believe, uh, apart from academia, I believe um, there's so many, so many fields of psychology that one can pursue. And mm -hmm. this is really one of those tough questions exactly. It depends on yeah. it depends on where you are, the culture you're coming from, the people around you, and what exactly you vision for the future. So this is right. not something that has a straight line. It's sort of like uh, it's wide and it's up to you to pinpoint because what I'm doing basically right now is looking at different things and trying to see what fits. You know, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm like, okay, this is what I want to be and then end up not liking it. Mm -hmm. And I would comment on what uh, Oslem was saying um, about the mental health. So there is limitations to it because where I volunteer and our beneficiaries, so they do have smartphones, but they, they don't have an email, you get it. Or they do have an email, but they don't know they have an email. So when it comes to different applications, it's sort of hard for them to actually access or even uh, upload an application or they're mostly used to Facebook, Instagram, and that's it. So when it comes to mental health, you need to tell the person you need an email. Usually signing up in applications, you either need an email, fuel either Facebook or Twitter, but usually it's an email. So formalization is also really important. Those are the sort of aspects when it comes to e-mental health. You get it. And also most people don't really have gadgets. And also digital literacy, you know, we just shifted abruptly right now. And now we're all digitalization, but not everyone. Yeah. Is. I am a technophobic person, but I am forced <laughs> to sit online and listen to my class. I can't even right. do most of the stuff, but I'm learning. You get it. So I'm forced. It's not because I want to, but I have to. But so you have to live mm -hmm. with a community. There is mental stigma. There is social norms. And now you're forcing them to do something they're not ready to do. You get it. And I remember right now, because of the COVID situation, our beneficiaries had to move to online English teaching and Greek teaching classes. And they didn't want that. You get it. Despite having phones, they wanted it to be face to face because that's what they're used to. Wi Fi right. problem and all this other problem. You get it. That's the problem. And also, when Oslem was talking about the visual, when it comes to visual, yes, I have learned how what to say what to use especially when i'm posting because when i was young i used to just post for the sake of posting but now i have to make sure that i don't evoke certain bad vibes and whatever mm -hmm. i'm trying to do is the right thing for example if you go to a verse venice surge which is like an earth art, art gallery so how you understand a picture is different from how the other person understands it you get it yeah. so you need to make sure that whatever a message you're trying to convey or display mm -hmm. is in the right form you know, you will have different people, either some rebuking you, some provoking you. Because I go to social media and I see people provoking people by certain yeah. images or text message. So you need to understand exactly what you're posting, what mm -hmm. you're doing, how it conveys. Because sometimes, yeah. like right now, we're wearing masks and I meet people who are really sad and I can't even mm -hmm. smile. I'm smiling, but they don't know I'm smiling because of the mask. And it's really right. important, you know, how you put yourself, the visual, how you put your image. So, mm -hmm. so 
and psychology, to be fair with you, how I understand it, psychology is every day. Because when I'm in class, I'm learning about how children adapt, how children are doing this, how animals are doing this, the altruistic nature. And I'm like, these are things I used to do and watch, and I didn't even know there was psychology. So it's an everlasting yeah. field. You know, you, you're doing it without knowing, you know, since yeah. you're young and growing up, evolution. So psychology is just, mm -hmm. Yes, psychology is just everyday <laughs> life. You know, yeah. they should give the definition to everyday life. So whether you, <laughs> do, whether, you have to, whether you don't like it, you like it, everyone is mm -hmm. doing psychology. Yeah. Uh, they're in class or not in class, but we are all doing psychology. And yeah. it's one of those amazing 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 feels yes i agree and and to add to your point about a picture a picture can really tell a thousand stories right to, to different persons how they perceive something and you know it's really important especially our young persons like teenagers growing up and you know it, it, things things are um getting you know curious and and these um you know, when you're putting out your emotions and stuff like that, it can impact your, your entire image, your your representation, your life. And, you know, people have to really be careful about that because, you know, the internet can be a very dangerous place too. <laughs> you know, like, yes, it has its pros and cons, but yeah, and like you say, it's everyday life. So, yeah. And any, anybody else wants to um, add? Um, well, because it's everyday life, it's part of, of our life every day. We breathe psychology, we see psychology. Um, yeah. So, of course, the career options uh, are endless, I, I think, limitless. Uh, you can yeah. study psychology, you can um, go to a communication science field, and you can, uh, I don't know, you can become a language expert, or you can mm -hmm. uh, move to business because you understand psychology behind uh, psychology of people, then you can be a great right. businessman, I think. Um, well, I think what I liked about uh, Kimberly's uh, speech earlier, uh, she said mm -hmm. uh, she wants to see what she's interested in, and, and then um, she wants to choose based on that. Um, I think, well, I would suggest the same thing to everyone who is unsure about what they want to do after they uh, study psychology. Um, see what you're interested in, get involved in, um, for example, Trinidad Psychology Students Association or EFSA. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I did, uh, honestly. Um, when I was doing my master's, I, get, I got involved in EFSA. I met uh, other people like Kimberly um, from across uh, Europe and um, I found out about Netherlands and I found out that, oh, I could actually like the psychology programs there. And um, yeah, so it was inspiring environment, very stimulating. And it's um, mm -hmm. it also uh, like being involved in um, organizations, doing voluntary work, it broadens your, your perspective. You also get to know yourself and others around you. Yes. Uh, and you find out your passion, where what you want to do. Um, well, I followed the research path, um, but, yeah, um, I like the research topics uh, that I am interested in, and that's um, that keeps me motivated. So this is what I want to study, and this is what I want to do. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's really amazing, and I mean, yeah, and I can see that you're very passionate about what you're doing, and that's the thing about it. Like people need to understand, you can't just jump into a career path just like that. You know, you have to build yourself up. Um, the foundation and, and then you would you know you, you would find yourself like you said Aslam and I think like for me um, psychology has gotten me to do a lot of introspection and I've, I've I think I've found my my career path meaning like I have something in my mind like I, I know okay this is what I want to do next you know so it is it's a growing process and you know everybody's different how they would 
um, you know, think about things. I know they would have other factors coming in between, like financial or if it's even provided in our country and that kind of thing. I know that that, that is our main problem, especially in Trinidad. But I mean, there is so much more in the world. And this is why I wanted to expose my Trinidadian colleagues to, you know, to, for you all to give uh, insights what is have out there as well. So, um, Mr. Leonard, if you have any thing that you want to add and we can probably wrap up. Yeah, I think just just uh, real quick, I kind of all the wholeheartedly second Oslam's point point of uh, be active, join uh, organizations like and specifically organize or specifically do things where you do do have some exchange with other other students or uh, even better sometimes where you get in contact with professionals as well um, mm -hmm. so that you just get a picture of what's even possible how uh, what um, people are doing how people got to that point as well and just get a get a sense of uh, different career paths different um, career opportunities and I think that's kind of the important part be open and be True. connected yeah. and, uh, and then you will get a much better idea of what's possible and what you could do with with your own and to get for yourself figure out what you're interested in and what you might not be interested in um and then adding to that you can also of course always do research on like uh, just go go to the internet search for what's possible with psychology uh, <laughs> or like what i sometimes like to do is uh, go go to linkedin and see like if I if I know like if I some somehow talk to a person that hasn't that is doing something interesting right now, kind of how what was their their path, what were things they were doing a couple of years ago, or um, also what other people uh, do like, do they connect to, or is there? And I think just being open, being out there, looking for what is possible, gives you a better idea of what you want to do and what you can do, how you can achieve it, and that's just uh, like that helps you to go that path. Um, yep. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to each and every one of you all for being here. I am so, so happy that you all joined um, the Student Psychology Association. I, I cannot express how grateful I am for having this panel discussion with you all. So any last remarks and because I, I'm not seeing any, if there's any questions or comments in the um, comment section, let me just... Yeah, um, if there are any qu qu questions, please do ask the question. <laughs> yes. So the floor is open for any questions before we close. Let me just check and see if anybody is um, posting any. Feel free, don't be shy. <laughs> all, all those who are alone and viewing, you all can ask your questions. This is your chance. <laughs> and if you, if you don't want to post it right away and you want to think about it feel free to always post the comments after we end the live on the live itself and we i can get back to you guys with an answer if there's any um you know burning questions that you would like to ask them with respect to their experience and everything that they have shared today so um i'm not seeing anybody posting any questions <laughs> Okay, so it seems like we have a shy bunch. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess we can end and wrap up now. Thank you so, so much once again for joining the European Federation of Psychology Students Association. I appreciate it very, very much. Um, and maybe some other time we can always collaborate and you know continue this conversation and yeah i hope everyone um stays safe during this time during the pandemic because i know it's it's really bad <laughs> um with you know having to stay indoors and not being able to socialize how we used to but at least we get to virtually connect with everyone and um 
you know, we, we are far, miles, miles and miles apart. <laughs> I'm in Trinidad, you're all from um, Tanzania, um, Netherlands and Germany, you're saying. So it's, it's amazing that technology can bring us to, together like this. And yeah, so thank you so much. Um, so now we're gonna wrap up and close. So bye everyone. Thank you so much for hosting us. Bye. Thank you for having us. Bye bye. Yes, bye. Yep. Thanks very much. And good luck with your careers in the future in psychology. <laughs> second, second to Leonard. <laughs>